Welcome to Spark Plugs here at Musser Public Library. We have a very well-known guest with us today, uh, Mr. Dave Bakke from Muscatine County Conservation. And so Dave, thanks for being here with us today. You're very welcome, Betty. Thank you for the introduction here and for inviting me. Well, we've just been talking, getting ready to, to start filming, and I can't believe how much I've learned just now, just now, sitting here together. So Dave has this wealth of information about all things wildlife related, and we're going to get some of that today. Yep. All things furry today. All things furry, yes. So I do have a book that I want to start with. Uh, this book here is a fairly new book. It is by Sue Farrell Holler, illustrated by Jennifer Feria. It's called Raven, Rabbit, and Deer. And so it really focuses on animals that are out in the wild in the winter. The other thing that I think is really great about this book is that it pictures a, a little boy and his grandfather helping each other out in the woods and helping each other learn and uh, helping each other experience the woods. They are Ojibwe, which is a um, native group of indigenous, indigenous people. The Ojibwe did not live in the area of Muscatine County. So I want to make sure to make that clear that the, even though many of the animals are the same, the Ojibwe are not from Muscatine County. But Dave, let's hear, let's just acknowledge the peoples who have lived in, in the Muscatine County area over the um, the thousands of years. Uh, sure, and the most recent ones that many people are are familiar with would be um, the Sac and the Fox tribes, and they've lived in in the eastern Iowa and western Illinois area for many many years for a long time. Um, they no longer live here as those groups, um, but a small group related to them. Uh, broke off and they currently reside in Tama, Iowa. I and mean, you may have heard of the Meskwaki Indians uh, and they were part of and related to the Sac and the Fox tribes. And so how many years are we talking about? Um, they may have been here for at least hundreds of years, mm -hmm. uh, but people were here even before then. You mentioned before, we're asking about the mound builders. Um, they may have been here. There are mounds that are found uh, mm -hmm. actually south of us in Louisa County. Mm -hmm. Toolsboro, is that Toolsboro, correct? Toolsboro uh, has a mound down there. So and they would have been here thousands. We're talking thousands mm -hmm. of years ago. Um, and then there were peoples here before them. And scientists, as they study and learn more about the archaeology of the area, they find they go further and further back in time saying we believe people were here now they're talking 10 15,000 years ago before the last glaciers came through and would have affected or had an impact on this area so um, as science advances we develop better tools for looking into the past we're we're changing what we know about those things well thanks for filling us in on a little piece of that mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's just always good to acknowledge we are not the first people who have ever been here in Correct. Muscatine. And people have lived here for generations and for hundreds and thousands of years and we acknowledge that and appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at this book here, Raven, Rabbit, and Deer. And so we'll have to see, Dave, if any of what you have brought corresponds with what's in our book here. Because okay. you are talking, going to be talking about animals in winter, and I see you have some very interesting things with you. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay, so let's take a look at this book. Now, it includes some words in Ojibwe, and uh, it's the names of these three animals. Ra Raven, who is Gagagi, Rabbit, Waboose and deer, Wawash Keishi. And I don't know if I'm saying those completely correctly, but I'm trying. That, I think that was a good try. Okay, so let's start with the little boy and his grandfather. They are going to go out in the winter and see what they can see. So here's the little boy who is the speaker of this book, the narrator. He says, I drop my boots on grandpa's lap. Want to go for a walk, he asks. 
I hold Grandpa's hand so he doesn't fall down or get lost. A truck and a bus and a car stop to let us cross the road. Now, I do love the perspective in this book. It's from the perspective of the little boy who can do some things that Grandpa can't do just because he's so much younger. I do wonder, though, if maybe Grandpa is holding the little boy's hand so that he won't fall or get lost, or maybe it's mutual. A big bird with black feathers stands on the back of a bench. Raven, says Grandpa. Gogoggy. Raven says, hello, hello. Is that anywhere close to what a raven would say, Dave? That's exactly what it <laughs> sounds like, man. <laughs> raven sounds like the brook in summertime. Now, do we have ravens in this area? Uh, we do not. Or if, if somebody sees one, um, it would be unusual. We have lots of crows, which are similar, but ravens are a little bit larger than a crow, but they also would be all black. But it would be noticeably larger than a crow. So if I see a bird that looks like this in our area, probably I'm seeing a crow. Yes. Okay. My boots make deep holes in the snow. I shake the prickly hand of a tree. Oh, look, I love how he calls the branch the prickly hand of a tree, and it does look like that. The snow shower tickles my face and creeps cold down my neck. I have had snow go down the back of my coat, and that is a funny, creepy feeling. We go around the curve and down the hill and over the wee bridge. The beaver house looks like a lump of snow. I show Grandpa how to kick snow into the bit of water under the bridge. I bet you Grandpa does know that already. But it's so nice to be shown how to do it by <laughs> someone so young and fresh. Grandpa puts the heel parts of his boots together. His boots make a V. I copy him and we trudge up the hill like tractors. Look at their footprints here. They do look like tractor prints. Big tractors go very slowly and puff out a lot of steam. Little tractors go fast, which I'm sure is true in this case. We look back. I see tracks of one big tire and one little tire lined up exactly together. I see marks in the snow that look like two hot dogs with two marshmallows in the middle. Here they are. That's what they look like, isn't it, Dave? It is, yes. <laughs> but I don't think it's hot dogs making that track. Probably not. So let's see what his grandpa tells him, because his grandpa knows a lot of things in this book uh, that I don't necessarily know. Rabbit, says grandpa. Waboose. I hop like a bunny. Grandpa doesn't hop. He watches. An animal hides in the trees. It is as still as a picture, and it looks at me. I point so Grandma, Grandpa can see. Dog, I say. Is that a dog? It doesn't look like a dog. What gives you a clue it's not a dog? Well, those things on its head look, if they're ears, they're really big ears. <laughs> and very unusual ears. Yes, yes, the head looks different. Yes, and Grandpa says, Deer, ah, uh, Wawash Keshi, how many do you see? I see one deer, then the twitch of a tail, another deer. I see one and one and one more. I hold up my mitten, this many, I say. Yes, says Grandpa, five. And do you know, Dave, I have noticed this kind of thing. I like to go out uh, with one of my children for a drive frequently in the evening mm -hmm. in areas where sometimes deer come out. And if I see one deer so many times, if I look more closely, I can see there's maybe three, maybe four. Mm -hmm. That's normal, especially now after Christmas. Before Christmas, they're often in the breeding season and you may see less of that, but now, they're, they're kind of herding up together, is mm -hmm. how we would say it. Um, and there's probably some safety in that for them, but also when they lay down to sleep or rest at night, um, if they're sleeping close together, they can help to keep each other a little warmer also, especially if it's very, very cold. Yeah, I imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
The one with the antlers is a boy like you, says Grandpa. The deer bounce away. They make tracks that look like I love you hearts cut in two. Very true. It does. I find a line of teeny tiny tracks that look like twigs. Bird, says Grandpa. Raven, I say. Gagagi. Sparrow, <laughs> says Grandpa. Sparrow is Raven's friend. It has much smaller feet than Raven. Grandpa's face is red and his eyebrows have frost when we get home. He doesn't want to roll like a log in the snow or dig like a dog or jump up and down. But you know, those are all really fun things and I bet you Grandpa loves watching his grandson do that. And if we look at his face, he seems to take some pleasure in that. He's got a smile. Yes. And he gets to hold the little stuffed bear too. Oh, yes. He carries me to go inside like a pile of firewood. My face tingles and the snow on my boots turns into a puddle. Grandpa puts two plates and two glasses on the table. He pours the heavy milk. I get the raisin cookies, a big one for him and a small one for me. Grandpa switches the plates. Big kids get big cookies, he says. We sit in Grandpa's chair, ready for reading time. He falls asleep before the end. I slide a blanket over him, then I snuggle close to keep him safe. And you know what? I bet Grandpa feels really safe like that. And that is the end of this book. The very last picture is looking at those teeny tiny little bird tracks that the boy made a great, a great hypothesis. He knew it was a bird, and mm -hmm. so he called it raven. But that one is much smaller than a raven, and so that was the sparrow. So that's the end of this book here, Raven, Rabbit, Deer. And now, Dave, I'm wondering, do you have anything with you that we saw here in this book? And what else do you have with you? Well, I, I have things that have to do more with like the deer and the rabbit. I have things mm -hmm. that are animals that are mammals. And I actually have a part of the deer and uh -huh. a part of a rabbit with me. So we'll find those as we're looking through these. So um, you asked me to talk about animals in winter. Yes. Um, and different animals do different things. And even in just the group of animals we call mammals, they do different things. There are, there's at least one kind of mammal that migrates, that flies away from here. Any guesses what that might be? An animal that migrates and flies away from here. Or did you say a mammal? A mammal. A mammal. Not a bird. Could it be a bat? It is a bat, oh. yes. There are several kinds of bats that live here that when it gets cold, they fly away. They have no food to eat. They eat insects. So they fly in a way where, to where it stays warm enough they can find insects. It's one way they can survive. But if they stay here, they're going to rely on their fur coat to help them either stay warm. If they're an animal that walks around in the snow, and there are plenty of animals that do, or even if they're hibernating, they still will have a fur coat just because they're a mammal. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the hibernation part. But the fur coats that animals have um, help them in a lot of ways. One, it helps, it helps us to identify animals. Mm -hmm. We can learn just by looking at their fur coats what kind of animal we're looking at. I see one in the middle, I believe I recognize immediately. Do you recognize yes. that one? Do you need to smell this one to know what it is? <laughs> no, I don't, okay. although that is a surefire sign of what it is. Right, and this one does not smell bad. This one, uh, this, this one has been cleaned up. Um, but our animals here are, of course, a skunk in the middle. Mm -hmm. This one is, a, is our friend the possum, and this one is the raccoon. And they're all animals that are very common in Iowa, and we see lots of them uh, around Muscatine. Yes, I've seen lots mm -hmm. of those just within the last few weeks. Yeah, and uh, these are all animals that behave in a similar way in the winter. The other things that animals can do is some of them will hibernate, and we can think of that as sleeping all winter long. Uh, but these animals do not hibernate if the weather is nice like today and maybe overnight tonight it's been a little warmer, they, they will be out looking for food. 
Um, but if it gets very cold or like Sunday and into Monday, it's supposed to be kind of stormy again, mm -hmm. they will just, they will sleep. And we have a word for that too. They don't hibernate, but we say that they would go into torpor. And that word, those two words, hibernate and torpor, are similar. Um, they, and they may be in their torpor for several weeks. So, and then it'll be like they're sleeping, but they will wake up. I was going to ask, is the difference between hibernation and torpor that torpor is shorter? Yes. And hibernation would be for the whole season. So, for instance, our friend the groundhog, the woodchuck, which is another one. This, was, um, this is one we've had for a long time at the nature center. Um, but they were going into their burrows and beginning to hibernate probably a little bit before Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, and they won't wake up. I guess one at least will wake up on February 2nd to, so we can see if they see their shadow or not. But most of them will stay hibernating until into mid-March. Um, and when an animal hibernates, it often is either because they won't be able to stay warm enough, maybe they have very short fur, but often it's because they can't find enough food. And woodchucks are vegetarians. And most of the time in the winter, most of our, our vegetarian foods that they might eat are covered with snow and ice, just like they are right now. Um, so uh, woodchucks would be eating grasses, flowers, um, not wood, we could call them flower chucks, I guess. That would be a different name that might be more fair for them. Uh, but they'll eat the bulbs from flowers but they that's what they would eat and those aren't just aren't available in the winter time well that makes so sense they then they would sleep mm -hmm. all winter yeah other animals like like these three can find things they may catch mice mice are out and about mm -hmm. in the winter time though they also will go into torpor if it gets very very severe weather um, they will eat other things they may find maybe a bigger animal that has died mm -hmm. out in the woods and they will feed on that they, if there's open water, they may be able to catch small fish right at the edge of the water. Um, and I know that at my bird feeders out at Salisbury Park, I've had raccoons and possums both many times at night. I'll see them, out, I'll look out the window, I'll see them sitting in my platform feeder eating bird seed. <laughs> so whatever they can find to fill their tummy, that's what they will eat. But for staying warm, um, their fur is, is a special fur. You know, mammals shed their fur and they grow new fur for the winter. So they do put on a winter coat. Uh, it's different from our winter coat, mm -hmm. but it's a winter coat. And when we look at it, and, and you can feel that if you want. It's, oh, yeah. It's very, very soft. Mm. And a lot of these particular animals have what we would call long fur. And so we can see different color patterns here. But down underneath, the thing that really keeps them warm is what's called their underfur. Uh, when I go outside, when it's really cold, I might put on some long underwear mm -hmm. to stay extra warm. And that's kind of what they have here. So for instance, on the raccoon, and I'm just going to push this apart, and you'll, I'll, there are two things I want you to see. As we look right down by the skin, we see there's kind of a, a, a medium brown or dark brown fur. Mm -hmm. And if you look up towards the top, you can see that there are different, different hairs here. Mm -hmm. And so scientists would call these longer hairs guard hairs. And this, this kind of cottony looking fur down here is called under fur. It so, looks very warm. It is. It is. And the guard hairs actually are what give this raccoon its colors. Because if we come up here where it looks almost black, mm -hmm. if we look down here at the bottom, it's the same, the under fur is mm -hmm. the same color. And we can even see that it's a little bit, a little bit wavy down in there. All those, all that under fur does is it, it holds the warmth of the animal right in there close to his body. So, and all over his body, that's going to be the same color. So here's something that's just, it's just an interesting difference. I don't know that it helps them survive, but on the skunk, when we looked at, we'll do the same thing. We've got, he has this black, these guard hairs, but down beneath he's got this, it's almost more of a gray color under fur right here. And again, it's very soft and cottony. But if we look on these white stripes over here, his under fur is white. 
Oh, wow. So most of the mammals, they have the same color under fur all over their body, but the skunks, um, I guess they feel they're special. So yeah, they, they have, just have to be different. They're black and white all the way to their belly. And then at our possum, again, you can see he's, he's kind of a dark, he's mottled with browns and some dark, and he has these white, these white guard hairs that make him look kind of frosty, but his under fur is all white mm -hmm. all over his body. It just, it's all there to keep them warm. It's just different patterns in them. It might help scientists with identifying an animal. If they found a bit of fur, they might be able to say, oh look, there's some, there's some of these colored guard hairs and, and some of this cottony under fur, maybe it's snagged on a, mm -hmm. on a sticker bush. And they might say, I bet that's from a possum mm -hmm. or a raccoon. And somebody who really studied it could identify most of the mammals that way. So even things like mice have got this under fur, but it's just, they have very short fur. Um, a quick question, just a side note here. So I have a little, I have a, a piece of paper here with a square that's one inch square. Mm -hmm. So sometimes scientists have figured out or people want to know how many hairs are there per square inch on an animal. For most people, it's around 12,000 uh, total on our hair. So okay. we have fewer per square inch. People like me have spots where there's three per square inch. <laughs> so it's different on different animals and it's different on people. But on something like a raccoon, scientists who study that have found that on a square inch, something that size, there could be 60,000 hairs oh my or more. Gosh. And that includes that under fur, because those are individual hairs, even though it looks like a little mm -hmm. cotton ball under there. Um, they have many, but their animals, they have more than that. So we'll look at some others that have even more than that, and for a reason. But having that many hairs tight together helps, helps to hold that body heat. Oh, I can imagine. And so animals that have a lot of that, they can withstand colder temperatures. Though there are some limits. I'm going to move these down. Would you like to maybe put these just in a pile down sure. here? You can, you can be the fur keeper here. Oh, and I'm looking at the possum's tail. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that, yes. Yeah. So what do you suppose happens to their tail in the wintertime? Well, it must get awfully cold. Well, and it does. And it's not unusual to find possums that have the tip of their tail missing because if they're out in very cold weather, it, they get frostbite just wow. like we might. Wow. But it's, can you feel that it's kind of almost a scaly oh, yes. texture? I, yes, and I certainly can. And that is some can. protection from that. Okay. Possums also have ears that have very little fur, and so sometimes you find, uh, let's see, these might be kind of, oh, they're just little nubs. Just little nubs yeah. there. But it's not unusual to see and find possums that the tips of their ears have been frostbitten as well. And that's, just, that's part of being a possum and living out there. <laughs> it's um, a hard life to be a possum. When they're sleeping, they're all curled up, so that's probably protected a little bit. Well, let's look at a couple of other animals that have some different behaviors. And I'm going to grab three of them here. And these are all animals that are different. because They're mammals, but instead of running around in the forest and through the fields, these are all animals that can and do live underwater. And so you'll notice that their fur looks a little different. Let's May I guess? Yes. Who this guess? is? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I'm looking at its long, thin body and mm -hmm. its thick, thick brown fur and its face. And mm -hmm. I, is it, is it an, a river otter? It is a river otter. Mm -hmm. Yep. And what about this one? <laughs> oh, look at that. It's, that fat fellow. Sometimes it's, it's it can be difficult to know because it, this is not what the animal looks like if you were to see it. But do you have a guess? Well, I'm, I'm actually guessing it's a beaver. It is. Okay. It is. And this, this the, the, the trappers would call, it, would call this a beaver blanket. A beaver blanket. And just okay. because when they're going to sell them, they, they take the, the skin off mm -hmm. and the, the skin is on the other side. So we have the skin of the animal and then the fur on the other side and they and they stretch it out mm -hmm. want to make it as big as they can mm -hmm. and then they and then they dry it like that and so when they're selling them a bigger a bigger blanket will be worth more right now beaver blankets are not worth very much money at all <laughs> but many people enjoy mm -hmm. enjoy the, the trapping aspect 
All right, so one other one here. This is a mink. Oh, wow. You ever wanted a mink coat? Have you ever had a mink coat? No, okay, no. I have not I, either. I, yeah. um, but th all these animals have short fur. Mm -hmm. And the mink is, is a little bit longer, but you can see there's the under fur mm -hmm. for the mink. It looks so warm. It, and, and it is. And even from, let's see, it's harder to see on the river otter because their fur is short, but there is a very dense under fur there. And even the beaver has a dense under fur. So they can swim in the water and usually when they're swimming, their under fur stays completely dry. Wow. Because all these animals have uh, an oil gland usually on their back legs and they spend time grooming themselves when they're resting, just rubbing that all over their body. So when they dive in the water, the water just sheds right off the top. And so the outer fur may get wet, the guard hairs, mm -hmm. but when they would get into their burrow or in, the beaver gets into his lodge in the winter time, they just give a good shake. Most of that comes right off and they've still got their under fur nice and dry. Wow, what a protective system. It is, and um, that allows them to uh, still look for their food. And river otters are hunting whatever's swimming in the water they're living that they're by. So fish or Sometimes they can find turtles that may be like right on the surface or, or freshwater mussels. Um, they're very good at finding what they need to eat there. Um, the beavers uh, are eating the bark off of trees and they do spend time in the fall cutting branches and they take them out into, if they're in the river, uh, uh, some quiet water, or they, if they're in a lake out a little ways from their lodge or their burrow, and they just, they swim down the bottom and they literally push the sticks into the mud wow. and they make a they call it a feeding cache and oh, so wow. when they want to eat they swim out from their underwater tunnel in their beaver lodge or their burrow which may have a, a tunnel that exits underwater they swim out there they get something to eat they bring it back to their den or their burrow and eat if it's a nice day like today they may sit outside and and feed as well so a very amazing system um they're engineers really very much so. Yeah. Yes, the beavers especially. Um, river otters are just playful. They're uh, they're they're one of the animals that are considered to actually do things just for fun, for playing. Mm -hmm. Most animals are very driven by things that will help them survive. Uh, very quickly on the beavers, um, they're actually famous. Much of North America was explored hundreds of years ago because people came from France, from Spain, uh, from England. Uh, for, to trap beavers mm -hmm. and nothing but beavers. And, and they would trade other things as well. Is that because beavers are from the, uh, the uh, Americas, from North America? They're, they're found in Europe as well, but in Europe much of the beaver population had been, had been greatly reduced mm -hmm. and so when they realized that when the, the earliest explorers uh, realized that there were beaver here, that was big news. It was a it was a, a big deal because they wanted them uh, for making different types of clothing, but mm -hmm. especially hats. Mm -hmm. And they did not use the skin side. All they wanted was this under fur. Wow. And they would so they would take those back. Um, and you and I might have had a job long, long ago back in France or Spain or wherever um, of removing those guard hairs. And this is how you did it: you grabbed them and you plucked them like this. Wow. So we would sit at long tables with many people plucking the hairs out of beavers. Um, they would then be stuck with just just the guard hairs uh, and they would use very sharp knives and they would kind of shave it to get mm -hmm. them very smooth but they also would sometimes remove all of it if they wanted to make beaver felt. They would mm -hmm. cut all the guard mm -hmm. hairs off after they removed these these guard hairs. They, they take the under fur is what mm -hmm. they would want. Um, and they would mix it with different chemicals, including mercury. Um, and they would, and all this was to help get those, those little bits of under fur to, to kind of grab each other mm -hmm. and lock together. Um, as you can imagine, some of them got sick mm -hmm. from doing that, which like led the mad hatter. to the phrase mad hatters. They, mm -hmm. were, they worked in the hat factories. Um, since they don't need to do that for making hats so much anymore, the, the, the need for beaver pelts has kind of been reduced. 
Um, okay, okay. Let's talk for just a minute about how you got these items. Okay, these uh, were all donated items. Um, I'll take that back. There were a few of them that were that we purchased. Mm -hmm. um, there are places where you can buy these online. Trappers will sell their furs, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes those companies, uh, they may have uh, places overseas that will buy them from them. Like River Otter would be one that would have some value overseas, uh, but others they would just they would tan them. That is, they would mm -hmm. preserve the skin with the hair intact. Um, and there are places, I guess, like nature centers that might buy those things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will say, hey, I'd like to have a fox pelt mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. So, but many of these were donated to us by local trappers uh, and some of them we've had quite a long time. This one, I've been here for more than 30 years and this pelt has been here that whole time. Um, and with, with good care, which mostly is keeping them dry and clean, they can, you know, there are pelts that have been around for hundreds of years and, wow. and they need to be properly preserved mm -hmm. too. Um, so yeah, people sometimes ask if I, you know, did I shoot and kill these animals? Uh, no, I've hunted in the past. I did not shoot and kill any of these animals. Um, trapping is, is a, it, it's a different type of, of hunting. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of special skills. Um, and many, many people who do it learn from someone when they're very young and mm -hmm. I was not around anyone who wanted to go trapping uh, just because it didn't interest them. Mm -hmm. The guy that I hunted with, he liked to go hunting for mm -hmm. rabbits and pheasants and squirrels and things like that. Um, so we, so at times I've asked several people you know, who, that I know who trap, I said, well, we're looking for a gray fox was one in particular. And, Somebody uh, finally said, I got a gray fox, and they did not have a lot of value. Uh, so he said, if you'd like it, you can have it. So um, that's kind of how we acquired all of these. So sometimes it's gifts from other people. Uh, one of them, oh boy, I'll pull this one out. Oh, not that one. This one. We'll have them both out here. Oh my gosh, look at so that. So this one came from another nature center wow. that was closing down. So this is this is a wolf. Oh, that's what I was a thinking mm -hmm. maybe it was. That's amazing. Yeah. And when you look at this, you can see, I mean, the, wolves are northern, typically northern animals. Um, and so they have not just long guard, deep guard hair, but they have long, or long guard hairs, but their, their under fur is very is very dense too. Wow. Um, and one of the values of having longer guard hairs is if it's um, raining or if it's wintertime and it's sleeting, the guard hairs are what get a layer of snow and ice on them. You know, snow will get caught in there and it keeps it keeps that under fur, which is really what's keeping them warm, from from getting all all soggy and sodden and matted down. So almost like a raincoat. Very much, yeah. yeah. Um, and if you've ever seen a long-haired dog that's been out in the rain and they come in and you think, oh, my poor dog is so wet, and they shake, and that's all very exciting. Um, but you realize that, you know, they seem to dry very quickly. And even for a lot of our dogs, a lot of that moisture is right up here at the surface, right down next to the skin, it's still dry. So um, it's, it's just another process here. The other one that I have here, uh, we, we don't have, we don't have wolves that regularly live in Iowa. They don't live that far away. Some of them are found in, in parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin, and sometimes they go wandering and they show up in northern Iowa. This is a coyote. Um, now we have plenty of coyotes. We have lots there. of coyotes, yes. Wow. Um, and, but you know, if you notice, the, the coloring looks different. I'm always amazed at nature. Nature does a lot with a very few colors, mm -hmm. um, a lot of blending. But, I mean, if we look here at their, their under fur, way down deep, it's, it's mostly gray, but even the under fur, though, has different shades. Up towards the top, it's got this brown tint mm -hmm. to it. So on some of the animals, it's all one color, and other animals, different, I guess, lengths of it have different colors. Sometimes these colors are here because on a day like today, bright sunshine, even if you're a mammal covered with fur, if you have dark fur, it's going to, it's going to absorb heat energy from the sun. Hmm. So 
that's another way, even on days that may be below zero, if it's bright and sunny day, they're still, they still have ways that they can get just a little bit more heat into their bodies. Okay. One final thing, and then I'll put some of these things away here. Um, on, on, the, on the raccoon and stuff, I asked you about how many hairs per square inch. What do you think on, on a, like a river? On oh my instance? gosh. Well, there must be so many because it's, it's, it's so dense. You know, it's much denser, I would think, than, than something like this. Mm -hmm. You said, did you say for the beaver? Did, I did you say? I did not. I did not. The beaver, um, and everyone's going to be a little bit different, of course, but on beaver, they estimate it's around 70 to 80,000 hairs per square inch. Wow. Could it be, could the otter be 100,000? Could be, yeah. Yeah. Shall we count? Yeah. <laughs> One, two. I think we'd lose our count quickly. <laughs> on sea otters, which is the only information I could find uh, that gave a number, um, but I, and I'm not, it's not enough to say, well, otters are otters, because mm -hmm. sea otters may be different, and they, they often live in very cold environments. Mm -hmm. They can have up to a million hairs oh. per square inch. Oh, my goodness. On their body. And so wow. when you feel that, it's just, I mean, you imagine how nice and soft this yeah. feels. Um, it is. It's so smooth and, and so mm -hmm. dense. Yep. And uh, seals also have a very high density count, I bet they, they do. would call it. Um, but they often do not have any underfur because they have a thick layer of blubber under their skin. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of hair, but they have blubber there, so they don't need the underfur. They've got a double, a double protection. Yes, and on whales, whales are mammals. Mm -hmm. They have really no, very little hair on their body. Thick, thick layer mm -hmm. of blubber. That's how they survive living in Arctic waters, which can be colder than 32 degrees. Mm -hmm. Salt water can be colder than that. I've got, let's see, oh, here it is. A mystery fur. Ooh, for you. oh my goodness. Now I thought this seemed, I thought this seemed dense. Yeah. This, oh my goodness. This is so plush. Wouldn't you like a nap? pillow made out of that. Oh my gosh. Or blanket. Yeah, what could this be? Now I'm trying to think of all the animals I know. Ah. Uh, hmm. I know that there's an animal called a chinchilla with very, mm -hmm. very dense fur. This would, I, be, this would be a giant chinchilla. If, it, if it's not a chinchilla. They're, okay. they're much smaller. Oh. We have seen this animal already today. Oh, um, um, we have seen this animal already. My goodness. Um, wow, you've got me stumped. Uh, yeah, let's see. Is it a, it's not a weasel. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, it's not a weasel. <laughs> it's uh, a mink? It is not a mink. One more guess. Mm. It tends to be a big animal. It's, one of, it's a, one of our larger wild animals. One of our larger wild animals. They can weigh 50, 60, sometimes more than 70 pounds. Oh my goodness. It's not a deer. No. Uh, you completely have me stumped, Dave. Tell me the first, a beaver? This, this is what's called a plucked and sheared beaver. So nowadays, if they're going to do this, they have machines that will pluck all the hairs out. And then they use, um, it's, I think it's called a planer, which is just sharp blades that mm -hmm. rotate around and they put it through and it just shaves the tip off. And this is one way, beavers aren't worth a lot of money, but this is one way that they can be sold because they can make coats, they can make mm -hmm. blankets out of this? Well, I will say that one of the differences between this and say something like this, the hairs here say on the river otter, they're all slightly different sizes and these are all so uniform that that makes it, and that it makes it seem like that is like a fabrication mm -hmm. process. Yeah, it might be hard. I don't know if you could buy something like this in Iowa. Uh, one of our staff people was at a fur conference that was up in Alaska, 
and they had a lot of products that they sell overseas mm. to the Asian countries mm -hmm. and Russia, and they had, they had it. So he bought just a piece since mm -hmm. we don't have that. But this is what's underneath on the beavers. Wow. It's this, it's this stuff, and it yeah. is just. Oh my gosh, I don't know how to describe to people how soft it is. It's, it's so, so soft. soft. It's it, so, so soft. When I take it to schools, the kids all want to, they all want a pillow out yeah, of it. Yeah, I'm it sure. Just, it just is so soft. So um, I've got a question for you, Dave. Okay. If you were able to be one of the animals that you've had the, the pelts from here in winter, which one would you be? Which one do you think would keep you like the snuggest and the most comfortable in winter? Um, Snuggest, I, I think something like the coyote or or red fox. Oh. They also have very, very soft, oh, yeah. very thick fur. That's beautiful and, and feels so soft. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm glad you told us about the under fur because now I, you know. Now you can see yeah. that, yeah. Um, but I don't know, I, also, I always feel like I kind of re relate to the river otters. Mm -hmm. um, it's that playful quality. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, and typically full of a lot of energy, but mm -hmm. yeah, um, I did a, um, a personality test. You can do a personality test for animals, see what kind of animal you are, and I, and I checked out as, as a river otter. Wow. So, um, maybe that's part of it, but um, I'm not a great swimmer though, so go figure. But, you know, for, for warmth, these longer haired mammals, most of the ones in the dog family have nice long fur. Uh, we looked at this one before we got started, and this is from, this is a red fox. Iowa also has gray fox, mm -hmm. and that's what this is. But again, especially when you kind of roll it like this, you can see those guard hairs, mm -hmm. um, and it's just such a thick coat of under fur mm -hmm. there. Um, they can sur survive in surprisingly cold temperatures. In other areas of the world, Arctic foxes, which have similar fur, um, they, when it's, time for them to rest if it's getting too cold they literally curl up or dig into a snowbank and they curl up and you know they live in areas where the temperatures are 40 50 below zero mm. and they can survive wow and it might mean taking several days and kind of going into torpor mm -hmm. uh, which which you know when they do that their body temperature drops a little mm -hmm. their heart rate stops their respiration slows mm -hmm. down Shouldn't, I think I said it stopped. It doesn't stop. It slows down the heart rate. Um, but those things allow them to use less energy while they're waiting sometimes for several days or several mm -hmm. weeks. And when the weather breaks, they're able to come out of that, you know, as opposed, like you said, to the hibernation. Mm -hmm. So um, sort of like putting your copy machine on energy saver mode. Yes. <laughs> yes, very much so. So, uh, and a lot of animals can do that. Some like... Um, Things like bobcats and coyotes, and a lot of the foxes, they tend to hunt almost every day, hmm. and sometimes in really ugly weather. Uh, they're just, they, they may not be able to go into torpor for as long as like raccoons and skunks can do, um, but they're just different methods for getting through the cold weather, and I suspect a lot of animals use a variety of different things. It may also involve finding good shelter. Mm -hmm. something out of the wind mm -hmm. um, uh, it's just that's part of their process too you know for deer um, where's my deer dog? yeah let's see the deer we have just a few minutes here it looks like maybe a minute or two oh yeah we're so we just about need to finish yeah. up but this is so beautiful and, and no I'm glad you I, I thought that because deer don't have any guard or they have I guess all guard hair but they have no under fur so, but they're their winter fur, and this is winter fur, is thick, it's dense, um, and these hairs are hollow, like a straw. But um, air can go into them, but not you, you couldn't drink fluids through them or anything like that. But by having hollow hair, that's just another layer of trapped air, which is really what your guard hairs do. They mm -hmm. trap air down there, helps them stay warm. Uh, their summer coat is not like that. Their winter coat is darker to absorb energy from the sun in the winter, you know, in the winter time. Summertime, their coats are a little paler, sometimes more reddish colored. Um, so when they when they shed their hair, they they put on their summer coat and their winter coat. 
And anybody who has dogs, dogs do the same thing. I have a cat at home and it sheds hair, it seems like all the time. Um, but animals are always, people too, we're always losing a little bit of hair, more is growing back, that's part of that process. But when it gets to be late summer, um, there may be more of this growing back in mm -hmm. there. And then in the springtime, you'll see animals, sometimes you may see a fox and think, that doesn't look very healthy, it's got long fur here and hardly any fur here. It's, it's shedding that under fur. Uh, and so for a while they look, they look not quite right. So, I don't know. It's great to be a mammal. <laughs> yeah, like there's so many different ways of staying warm, you know, yes. from the hollow hairs to the guard hairs and, mm -hmm. and everything. It's, it's um, always amazing for me to hear how many different uh, survival methods there are out in the natural yeah. world. Yep. And now tell us, I think there's one of these pelts you're going to leave here for a week at the library so that if yes. kids would like to come in to the children's yeah. department desk and yep. ask to see it, that we'll have it here for one week. We'll leave our gray fox. Oh, this is such here. a beautiful one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so sometimes when hunters will, you know, if they got, and I, it may have been somebody else, you go, oh, you can see the inside where mm -hmm. there were some, this was sent to a tannery. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when they, they're removing the skin from mm -hmm. the animal's carcass, you get little cuts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where they've sewn those. They've sewn yeah. those, they have a special sewing machine. That, that those are all stitches. If you ever looked at the inside of a, like a mink coat, um, you would be able to see how many mink it took to make wow. that coat. And it can take dozens and dozens wow. of mink to make one coat. Yeah, so very, very interesting. Well, uh, thanks for coming in to tell us all of this information and also for leaving this one here for a week. And so once again, for families, if you're interested in, in feeling this, now yeah. you said this is a gray wolf, is that right? Gray, gray, gray fox. Gray fox, mm -hmm. sorry about that. See, good thing you're See, here. I brought a gray yeah. wolf, so that's... that's <laughs> So if you're interested in, in taking a look at this, we'll have it at the uh, Children's Department Information Desk, and we staff that desk on Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then on, on uh, sorry, Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., Fridays till 6 p.m., and then Saturdays 10 to 2, and Sundays 1 to 3. So for the next week until okay. Uh, what day is today? Today is the 21st. This is, is Thursday, right? yes. Yeah, so till next Thursday, the mm -hmm. 28th, then we'll have this here. And then yep. uh, you or Michelle can pick it up next week because you all will be joining us for the next few weeks. That's at right. Plugs. That's right. And so we have lots of interesting things that we'll be talking about, leaning on your expertise. I think next week is birds birds are yes bird feeding yes yeah. backyard birds bird feeding should be lots of fun next week we'll have something to send home with you just like last week we had these these owl pellet kits that uh, we put our joined our forces together and made these up it's got the owl pellet it's got the magnifying glass the tweezers the plates all the information so we still have these here at the library. We had 30 to begin with and we'll give them out until we've used them all up. But these are, uh, if you want to see what's inside an owl pellet, Michelle was here last week and yeah. walked us through that. Mm -hmm. You can watch that video again if you wish or see it for the first time and come in and get this to do at home. So it's so nice that that uh, County Conservation is joining us for Spark Plugs. And oh, we're excited. It's so much fun, and, and this is something, it's just amazing to see these things, and I learned so much. So thank you. Well, yep, you're very welcome, Betty. Thanks for inviting us. Anytime. Mm -hmm. So we'll see you all next week for another Spark Plugs with Muscatine County Conservation and birds. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.